Hey guys, John Faulkner here with Big Daddy Unlimited, and today I'm joined by my buddy Bill Clark from Defensive Training Group. Uh, Bill lives in the area and is part of the Big Daddy Unlimited network, and today we're going to talk about EDCs. So, uh, Bill and I are, are very similar when it comes to the EDC approach and CCW approach, and uh, we're just going to break down what we carry and kind of show you guys also that, you know, it doesn't take a wheelbarrow to, to carry, you know, what a lot of people say is, is a lot of gear, um, but that you can carry it, look normal, dress normal, but and be yet, very comfortable doing so. Yeah, and be very comfortable, but yet still have the ability to handle different situations. And we don't just mean different situations with a firearm. It could be just a flashlight searching for something or, you know, a knife, you know, opening a box or mail or medical gear. Um, so we'll show you and you'll kind of see, you know, Bill and I are similar in a lot of ways and then different in some ways. So, um, but the biggest thing is finding a system that fits you that you are comfortable with that you can do it every single day. Because we see, you know, that's big, the biggest thing. Uh, most people that carry a 1911 carry it every day except for the day you ask them, right? That's very true. There you go. So, um, so we're just gonna kind of break down our system, so come along. If you got any questions or comments with regards to EDC, make sure you leave them below as well. So, all right, you wanna start? I'll start. So the, uh, the first thing to think about, and, and John talked about this, when you're planning out your everyday carry setup, uh, the first thing you need to do is, is identify what the mission is. Why are we doing this in the first place? Um, I'm a retired cop, and I used to deal with this a lot when talking about off-duty carry with my police officers. And what I found were people would approach this from the idea that um, it's a just-in-case kind of thing. And my response to that is always, just in case what? You're about to die? It's kind of important. It's, uh, there's a, a term out there a friend of mine uses, Chase Jenkins, he talks about it's a um, low frequency, high consequence event if you do find yourself needing some of this equipment. So when we're planning out what we're going to carry, it has to first and foremost be capable of accomplishing whatever mission we've determined we're going to be faced with or potentially faced with. So I'm not saying that you've got to carry a big gun. You're going to see that we carry full-size pistols. The point is rather that whatever you do carry has to accomplish that mission. It has to be something that you can fight with and handle whatever threats you're considering uh, as possibilities in your day-to-day -day life, depending on where you live and what you do. So generally speaking, I do carry a full-size pistol. This is one of my, my carry guns. This is a full-size Glock 17 that has been enhanced by ATEI and Great Lakes Custom Works on the grip work down here. It is equipped with an RMR, backup irons. I always carry the the weapon light, in this case, a Surefire X300 Ultra, uh, primarily because having the weapon light gives me options. Um, I also carry a handheld flashlight that you're going to see in a second, but in case I've only got one hand, I have children, in case I'm holding on to my daughter and only have one hand to run the gun, this gives me the ability to still have a light that I can use to identify uh, what I'm, I'm pointing the gun at, that kind of thing. Do have a secondary weapon. This is when uh, I need a small gun, which is not, I like the full size gun, but there are a rare number of occasions where I choose to carry something smaller. This is primarily my backup gun. This is a Glock 43. Uh, it's also been through ATEI and Great Lakes Custom Works. Um, has a lot of the same features though, a lot of commonality in my training and whatnot. It's still a full nine millimeter. It is a lot smaller. Uh, but it's also, because of that, it is more, uh, more difficult for me to, to employ. It holds less ammunition. There's less to hold on to. I don't shoot it quite as well as I do my full-size gun. So that covers the, uh, the guns themselves. Then we get into the holster. Now, the holster and the belt are going to be critical parts of this equation. If you've got something that is not comfortable, that you feel like uh, it prints really, uh, really badly and you're going to be self-conscious about what you've got on, you're not going to carry as much. So um, you want something that's going to work with your body type. You want to put it into a consistent position. And just like a pair of new shoes, you have to give it time to acclimate. You've got to be acclimated to it. It has to kind of mold to your body. I like appendix. Um, I've got this same holster on right now with a full-size Glock 17 and a spare magazine. Uh, this is from T5 Custom Kydex. There are several different versions out here that integrate the magazine pouch with the holster. Uh, I've tried several of them. I'm a bit of a holster nut. I've probably got a dozen different manufacturers. We all have that box. Uh, I've got many boxes. boxes. I have like, yeah. at last count, I'm up to 300 something holsters. Um, custom holster makers go, Bill, you got a lot of holsters. Yeah. My wife tells me I have a problem. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Um, in any event, 
Uh, I like this, uh, this type of setup. Some people uh, will correctly say that uh, this limits some of the movement within the, the waistline because you do have the, the wider space clips. Okay. I like it for that reason though because it does give me more stability and consistency of my presentation. Um, the, uh, this is equipped for a weapon light. Most of my holsters are set up for a Glock 34. Some of you may ask, how, how can you conceal something that large that comfortably? I have worn this holster on a 15 hour car trip up to Ohio. I've taught using this holster, gotten back in the car and driven back. Yeah. Find something that works for you uh, and you can, it's not gonna be as comfortable as not having the gun on, but it can certainly be something that is as comfortable as possible and that you can live with. So, and, for and a good I'll, kit. You know, and I'll tell you too, like Bill said, we all, we all have, most of us have boxer boxes of holsters. Uh, and if you have a buddy that has boxer boxes of holsters, um, that's, you know, for a gun that you're maybe considering, go see if you can just borrow their holsters for Absolutely. a week or so. Um, because there are times where you're like, that is the one. That is it. It solves all my issues. That mm -hmm. is it. And you get it and you're like, this is horrible. And you just throw it in the box. Um, you know, and, and like Bill, I mean, I carry appendix every day as well. Um, and I use a Veil Solution holster. You know, so, so Bill and I are very similar and then different a little bit too. Uh, I prefer leather belt loops just due to the fact that they're, for me, they're easy on, easy off. Um, and I know that I always have a, a good purchase all the way around my belt, even if one of these were to break. Um, and if you buy quality holsters, they'll have quality leather ho loops on them. I have never broken a leather loop. No. Ever. They're very, very difficult ever. to break. And what you'll, the, the other thing that I, I've also noticed with regards to, to, to loops is you'll start to see them fray. Mm -hmm. Where usually when a plastic one breaks, it, you don't even notice it until you pull the holster and the holster comes out with the gun. Um, that's, that's when you know it just broke. Um, and that is true. That was more of an issue when you had Kydex. Now yeah. that they've gone to the injection yep. molded, the breakage is, is less. The other thing is if you have the standalone type holster, uh, I, I, I have greater concerns with these because you only have the one clip. Yeah. In this case, because I have the two clips, a yeah. little bit less concerned. I have fought people back during my career. I have fought people wearing uh, not this holster, but one just like it from the same manufacturer. I've rolled around, I've done DT, I use it as my training holster, my competition holster, my teaching holster, my everyday carry holster. Uh, the big thing about the belt loops, even with belt loops or the clip, is make sure the belt that you're using is yep. fit for the attachment device. Uh, that's going to greatly increase the, uh, the stability and the, uh, the engagement of the locking device on the belt and it's going to help minimize the possibility of it popping off. Yeah, and I mean, as you can see, you know, Bill's carrying a 17. Uh, I'm carrying right now, I'm trying it out. It's a salient arm strike one. So this is a 17 size with a X300 on it uh, from Surefire. Uh, it's a big gun, you know. So, uh, but it's one of those things where like Bill said, you know, as long as you get the right clips and then a, a, a sturdy belt, which we'll talk about also, but mm -hmm. a sturdy belt and then cinch the belt tight, there should be no wiggle in your gun at all, mm -hmm. unless you actually kind of manipulate it a little bit. You know, you see a lot of people that are like, oh, I have issues with printing. It's usually because their belt isn't tight enough um, or they're not running the right clip system to actually secure it to them, I would Absolutely. say. Absolutely. So, um, and so that movement will also uh, tend towards making you more self-conscious about yeah what's going on, and again, that may result in you not carrying as often as you So, can. So yeah, and the holster that I'm rocking in this is a Veil Solutions Ronin holster. Uh, I had Chris Wimmer over there make this custom for me just because this is an option, gun option that you don't see that often, but you awesome. know, Veil Solution holsters, they're fantastic. So, so that's what I've been rocking, but usually it's either that or a full-size M&P. Yeah. Uh, I'm a Smith & Wesson kind of guy. So. Got your acro back yet? No, no. next week. No. Okay. Next week. Um, now, Going along with that, uh, if you're whether you're using a standalone holster or the combination, carrying spare ammunition is going to be yep. a critical consideration. Yep. First and foremost, uh, I had too many rounds, said no one ever in a gunfight. Okay, um, they go quickly, quick, more quickly, even with a high capacity weapon, 17 rounds in the gun, it's going to go quick. Second of all, with a semi-automatic weapon system, your weak link is the magazine. So if you have a magazine failure, you're now stuck with a single shot unless you have a spare ammunition source that you can go to and uh, get back in the fight. Yeah. Um, 
magazines tend to be easier to carry. There's not a whole lot of bulk to them. Even if you have an outside the waistband pouch and it sticks out a little bit, it doesn't really look like anything necessarily, um, unlike the, uh, the, uh, the, the gun itself. Yeah. So, um, so you always carry appendix extra mag? Uh, yes, I always, always carry, just like I'm doing now, like yeah. I said. So I've got my spare magazine here. Everything is up front. If uh, I am in a position where um, you know, someone's kind of giving me the eye, which has actually never happened, but I think about these things, it's very easy for me in this position just to yeah. cross up, and I now cover everything up. If something's going bad and I don't feel comfortable, I can start playing with the hem of my shirt, and am I just a nervous Nelly, or am I actually halfway through the draw stroke? Only I know. Yeah. Um, appendix gives you a lot of advantages. It is, it is comfortable in, uh, in a vehicle if you have the right equipment. A lot of these holsters will look very similar. Mm -hmm. There are subtleties in the design that can make a huge amount of difference, and that's where you have to. You can't just read an article. You can't ask a buddy. You have to get something and live with it yeah. for a little bit to find out what's going to work for you. Yeah, and with regards to a spare mag, you know, uh, sometimes I'll carry an appendix. Uh, I don't know why. So I carry my appendix kind of like built almost 12 o'clock. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people kind of can't, you know, to like a one o'clock position if they're right-handed, uh, 11 o'clock if they're left-handed. But I, I, I keep it really centered. And I don't know why I could just never truly get comfortable with a, a mag in an appendix carry. So uh, I wear jeans pretty much every single day, just based on what I have to do work-wise. Um, I never wear cargo pants, so I don't have cargo shorts, but like I either wear, like today I'm wearing some That's tactical distributor uh, pants that have a mag pocket built in, kind of between like your front pocket and back pocket. Um, the Vertex Defiance pants mm -hmm. do it as well, so I carry those two quite a bit, but if I'm wearing just a normal pair of blue jeans, I just use my back left pocket. That's what I've always done. I, I've ran classes with it. I can carry a full mag. I can carry a mag with an extender on it. Easy to get to. Um, and, and that's what it's been more, most comfortable for yeah. me. You and know? the big thing is just be consistent with what right. you're doing so that your hand knows where to reflexively go in the case you need to access. So, so yeah, so I mean, that's where I've, I always carry my, my spare mag. So, mm -hmm. all right, moving on, knife. So, um, well, let's talk about oh. belt, belts first. Belts, yeah. So now belts. Belts are, that's one of the things that people kind of gloss over. They go, oh, well, I've got my, my two-ply chicken liver thing that I got from Walmart. The belt is a critical part of this overall equation. Yeah. It's A, going to give you the stability and support to support all of this equipment. And also, again, you need to have something that is married to the, uh, the belt loops or the mm -hmm. belt clips, depending on what you're using, in order to get that good, stable fit that's not going to pop off as you move around. Um, the one that I'm using, this is from Aries Gear, and this is the Enhanced Aegis Belt. Really, really good piece of kit. I've got several of them. Uh, top of the line, uh, nice and thick, double yeah. double uh, thickness webbing that's going to support all the equipment. And you're going to see I have more equipment than what we've talked about so far than I am wearing actually on my waistline. Yeah, for me, um, always carrying appendix, always carrying bigger guns. I just got tired of belt buckles, period, end of story. Uh, they print, and guys are like, bring them over to your side, and then you got to go bathroom, and you're trying to run belts through belt loops. Figure out how I just want to go to the bathroom. Out, yeah. Uh, so I use a blue alpha gear. Um, it's just it's just got a loop on the metal loop on the side. You run the belt through, you pull it back through the same side, velcro it. I have no belt buckles at all so that start to print even more. I think belt buckles almost print more than the gun does most of the time. Um, it just makes it a smaller pack. So like they're affordable. Blue alpha gear belts are affordable. 40 bucks or so. I've never had one. This one I've been wearing for over a year. Made in America, awesome quality, guys in Georgia there. Um, so that's stability. That's what I run. Yeah. That's what I run every day. And people are like, oh, you need a belt buck. I'm like, dude, just cinch the thing down, Velcro yeah. it in, and you're good to go. Just make sure it's so, locked in. So that's what I run as far as a belt. All right, So knife. moving on. So um, if the only solution you have for a, uh, a lethal force type situation is your firearm, then that's going to be the only thing that you can, uh, can, can yeah. default to. Edged weapons and empty hand combat by, by extension, the martial arts and whatnot, are also things that you should consider. Talking about edged weapons specifically, there are times when the gun may not be your first best choice. In extreme close quarters type of situations, when the person is right on top of you, if you try to access that firearm, all you're doing is introducing a firearm into a wrestling match potentially, and, and now a gun that maybe they didn't know was there all of a sudden is in the mix. They're going for the gun. You can potentially lose the gun, and you can't employ it correctly to begin with. 
Uh, the vast majority of our engagements when we're practicing, we extend the weapon all the way out and use it the way that it's intended to be used. Now, there are close quarters, extreme close quarters techniques that we can, uh, we can, uh, uh, can utilize. Yep. They require a lot of practice to do them correctly and to do them efficiently. But just consider for a second that the handgun, if you cannot use it the way you're supposed to, uh, one thing to consider is maybe I should go to something else. So in my case, I carry a, uh, an edged weapon. If I'm fighting for my pistol, I can access my edged weapon. This is from a company called Tactical Trailer Park. And uh, I like ring blades because I can get my hand on here and you're not getting this away from me. Interesting thing, I do a demonstration in class uh, fairly frequently and I don't talk about it uh, beforehand. But as I'm holding, uh, I'm talking to the, to the class and whatnot, I'll pull my pistol out, keeping it pointed straight down to the deck, and I'll start walking around the class. And I'm demonstrating that you can move through a crowd and not muzzle anyone. You can do so safely, finger indexed on the frame, weapon pointed straight down. And, uh, and it's, it's interesting that people will be kind of just watching as I go, and they're not really concerned. Come back around to the front of the class, holster back up, pull my knife out, start doing the same thing. They know I'm not going to stab them. I mean, we've been in class together, and uh, they, they trust me to a reasonable degree, at least. But the, the visceral response to this is completely different. And I think the psychology of it is, even though we know this is a lethal instrument, we've never been shot for the most part. We've all been cut. Paper cut, scissors, cutting yeah. onions, whatever, in the kitchen. We know what this feels like, and we have just a completely different response to uh, an edged weapon. And there's a psychological component there, an impact that should not be discounted. This comes out, people want to get away from you because they know what this will do. So this is a good piece of kit that I use. I wear it cross draw on my support side. If I'm fighting for this, I come around, my support hand is free. I can access it with my support hand if I need to. And again, um, I like the ring because that does give me a, a lot of control. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll carry, carry a, a clinch pick. Mm -hmm. Quite often, I don't have it today because it's actually getting sharpened. Uh, I gave it to a buddy that has a good sharpener. So, but I will carry a Emerson knife with the wave feature. You can get out of a pocket real quick. Uh, the wave feature, the hook here, will catch your the pocket of your of your pants oh, and it pulls boy. the blade out. Uh, which I have found that's it's even faster than like an automatic yes. blade that you got to get out and then push a button or something. I mean, literally, it can be done with one movement. Yeah, just one movement. I mean, just pull it out and and, then and it's it's super quick to deploy. Um, I always keep that you know in my in my right hand pocket. Um, and I use it, I mean, I'll, I'll cut stuff with it. I keep it sharp, but I cut, you know, boxes and, yeah. and crap with it. And I've also um, got my, and so going along with this, he can deploy that with just pulling out of his pocket. I can pull this out. I have to do a separate issue. This is yeah. not a, a switchblade. This is just an assisted opener. Yeah. But there's a separate, op or a separate maneuver or a technique that I have to do in order to get this thing to actually open. But having a knife is always a good thing. What do you carry as far as flashlights? So, flashlight, this is one of the best pieces of equipment you can carry. And I'm still uh, using... Where do you keep it? I keep it in my, my uh, support side, back pocket, just clipped in. Uh, this is a, an older Surefire P2X Fury Defender. It's a single output, clicky switch in the back. I can hold down for momentary yep. or click down to actually make it go on and off. Um, this is one of the best things that you can get and put in your everyday carry gear. First of all, people say, why do you carry a flashlight? And the answer is to see in the dark. Uh, if I drop something, if I'm going out to the car, if something rolls under my desk, I can use this to find it. Mm -hmm. it, it seems silly, but, but people that used to give me a hard time back when I was working as a law enforcement officer, uh, it was funny because they would be like, yeah, that's silly, why do you carry all that? Hey, can I borrow your flashlight? I dropped something. Uh, this is one of the best things. You can take it anywhere, non-permissive environments as the term goes, you can still use this. All of my Surefires run, the reason I haven't gone over to the new one is that the, uh, they don't fit these yet, but this is the switchback from Theorem. Great piece of equipment, very simple. Again, gives me the control with the ring. Yeah. There's actually a technique that you can utilize this as a weapon light if you're gripping your gun, and it's specifically designed to do this. I like it simply that uh, when I'm out walking at night, it, it's just I'm not going to drop this. Even if I'm startled, if my hand bumps, yeah. if I crack my elbow, I'm not going to drop this thing. It's got the built-in clip here as well. And this is the backup in case my weapon light fails. Yeah. You know, because there are times that I want to look at something and not necessarily point the gun at it. And you kind of see Bill and I run the same gear on the same side, but he's I'm right-handed, he's wrong-handed. So it's just 
It's a flip. But I'm in my right mind, though. <laughs> Just pointing that out. So I've actually been rocking the uh, the Surefire Stiletto for quite a while, and you know it has it has a max mode with a pressure switch on the back. It also has a, a switch on the front if you want to toggle through modes. Uh, but you know this is a task light. Uh, you know, yeah, looking for your keys when you drop something yeah. in the dark, anything like that. It's a task light. Uh, I tell people all the time, this is a weapon light. The X300 that, you know, Bill has on his Glock, it's a weapon light. These are a task light. That's what they're, they're designed and purpose for. Um, so that's how I utilize this. I love the fact that it's rechargeable. It's thin. You know, I can throw it in my pants and it, it just disappears. Um, I, I, I love the, the theorems. Andrew and the guys over there are, are awesome. Um, and I'll carry, like Bill said, going into a non-permissive environment or something like that, then I'll carry a larger light. Uh, when I'm going through the airport, like if I'm flying, mm -hmm. I'm traveling this week again, I travel every week it seems like, I'll carry a larger light. Yeah. Just because that's the only thing I'm gonna be able to have on my body, um, so I'll carry a larger light on me. But day to day, it's usually just a uh, Surefire Stiletto. So, all right, moving on. So, um, something, and this is a big thing that a lot of people neglect, if you can make holes, it's probably a good idea that you can fix holes. Uh, so we need to talk about our medical, gear, our medical yeah. kit and medical gear and whatnot. And you don't have to carry a whole lot. And the applicability, the usefulness of this is far beyond yeah. using the gun, uh, any kind of combatives. If you're out and about, uh, I walk a lot, if you're out and about and you come across a car crash, you can maybe save a life. You get someone that's severed an arm, severed a leg, has an arterial bleed, you can possibly save their life. Uh, I've got kids. Um, uh, I remember a time my, my, my son was out uh, scootering with his cousins, and one of them took a bad spill and really split his leg open pretty good. I got my kid out, and it was no big deal to clean them up. Uh, one of my doctor buddies likes to point out that it's, it goes beyond just cleaning the per or fixing the actual injury, but the psychological component of making it look nice and neat. You don't see the lacerated flesh and whatnot goes a long way to helping with shock and other of the psychological impacts that these injuries can happen. So, in my case, everywhere I go, I carry... We got mics here. and stuff on, so Bill's so, just... I carry a... a, a I was issued um, with the Marshal Service on the task force. We use the SOFT wides uh, as our standard. The CAT 7s are also really good, yep. but I'm used to these. This is why I care. People always ask, why don't you use CATs? It's a little bit of personal preference. Um, this it's is almost what, Ford or Chevy. It is. And uh, there, you know, some of them are better in certain yeah. circumstances. Some are better in other circumstances. Uh, I like these. This is what I was taught with, so this is what I use. And I wear it everywhere I go. It's on a Filster flat pack. It just goes strictly on my belt. I actually modified mine with clips rather than the belt loops yeah. so that I can take it off uh, quickly and uh, if I need to, if I'm changing out a tack belt uh, when I'm out teaching and doing stuff like that. But I carry this everywhere I go. Very benign. No one even knows what it is. And if they ask, I can tell them it's a medical device. It's yep. a tourniquet. I've taken this on airplanes and it's no big deal at all. This is the, the, the most in, important piece because one of the, the, the most preventable combat injury is extremity bleeding. Uh, we, can, we can fix and save lives just with that right there. Going beyond that, you can buy these pre-made. A lot of different companies uh, sell small individual first aid kits, IFACs, that either have a little pouch or fit into a bellows pocket. I tend to wear the 511s because I carry all this equipment and the bellows pocket just makes it easy, even in my shorts. This is one that I put together because I wanted certain things that other ones didn't give me. So in this case, it's a single serve kit. It's got a pair of uh, nitride gloves that I can use. It's got some hemostatic agent, in this case, combat gauze. It's got chest seals and a compression bandage. The bag itself can actually be used as an expedient pressure bandage. And then the tape is, that's what the tape is wrapped around for to help hold everything in place if I need to. This just goes in my pocket. And again, this is completely benign. If someone sees this, what is that? It's, it's a, a first aid kit. It's mm -hmm. no big deal. Um, but it's something that I carry everywhere I go. It's very light, it fits right in my pocket, and it's no big deal. Uh, I've never had anybody ask me. On these pants, it actually sits all the way in. On my shorts, it kind of sticks out, yeah. but it's a plastic bag. Yeah. You know, no one, no one pays attention to it. And this is one thing where like, Bill and I attack the same problem with two different solutions. So Bill is either wearing pretty much cargo pants, and his cell phone. We'll say cell phones here. Yeah. Cell phone. I have cell phones too. Cell phones so, are very important. Um, always have cell phones on you. Um, but Bill is pretty much either wearing cargo pants or, silent, car sorry. or cargo shorts. 
Normally, I wear cargo so, shorts. We live in Florida. We live in Florida. Uh, I wear shorts almost year round. Um, I wear jeans pretty I much every day. I, I don't wear cargo pants. So I go with an ankle kit just because uh, it's the easiest way for me to, to carry more stuff. So this is a perfect progressive force concepts ankle kit that I've modified somewhat. Uh, pretty much have all the same stuff that Bill carries in his pocket. I just carry it on my ankle. Um, now, if I am wearing shorts, I do wear shorts. Uh, I have legs, but I, I'll put this same kit, kind of like Bill's, in my back left pocket. That's, that's where it goes. But in here, I got gloves, chest seals, um, hemostatic agent, and some duct tape. Um, also, I carry, and it's one of those things where it's, it's making your kit fit how you're going to wear it. You know, you'll see a lot of these ankle kits come with trauma shears. They're big, they're bulky, they, your, your, they pant a lot, leg, a lot of space. your pant leg gets caught on them. Yeah. So, you know, I go with a, a Benchmade triage, so it's got a blunt nose to it, so you can run it up under somebody's pants uh, and not have to worry about cutting them. Um, and it also has a safety hook um, on the back. So you can, you know, you can get somebody undressed very quickly with a hook, uh, a decompression needle. And then once again, just to kind of make it fit my lifestyle, I put a rat's tourniquet in here uh, for, for two reasons. Number one, I got a four-year-old. Um, mm -hmm. Tourniquets can be hard to get on small limbs, um, so a rat's tourniquet makes that a little bit easier. Um, these things can be effective as long as you get them wide and spread out. They can be very effective. But once again, uh, it's not a like a cat tourniquet that's sticking up real tall with a big windlass and anything like that. It's just small. It's compact. That's why I utilize it. Now, if you grab my other med kits, they all have cat tourniquets in them just because that's, yeah. that's, what I, that's what I prefer to go with. But in this system, this is what fits best. So um, it's always on me. It smells like it's always on me, uh, but we go from there. Nice. So, nice. Um, all right, what other accoutrements? So, um, well, that, that's about it as far as the equipment. The, the last thing to talk about is it's not just a matter of buying all this stuff and throwing it on. Yeah. There is an experiment in fa experimental phase, experimenting phase, where you're gonna figure out how to integrate this stuff into your life so that you can carry it effectively, so that you can carry it day in and day out and uh, not be like, oh, I don't wanna put that on because that hurts, that, that, that's heavy, that pulls my pants down, that does all this kind yeah. of stuff. Um, just to show you, so you don't think I'm making it up. So again, full-size Glock 17 with a weapon light, the full magazine, and I can squat down. Yep do all kinds of stuff. I've got complete movement, no big deal. Nothing's poking me, nothing's pinching me. I know how to move in these things. One of the things you have to learn when you start carrying all this stuff, but even just the gun on a regular basis is how you're gonna move when you're yeah. grabbing stuff off a high shelf and doing things like that. Uh, integrating all this into your day-to-day -day life so that it's not a hindrance, it's not something that you dread doing, it's just something that you put on. It's no different than putting your watch on or putting your wallet in your back pocket. It's just part of your everyday ensemble yep. that uh, is very comfortable, very normal, and you actually feel weird if you don't have it on. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, and it's one of those things, I mean, I carry other things, of course, keys, uh, Listerine, breath strips, because nobody likes bad breath. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, back it. left pocket, I always carry, okay, you can call it whatever you want, a sear kit. Um, it's got lock picks and stuff in it, it's something that I'm proficient in, I'll just say that. Uh, so it's things like that that I can help people if they're been locked out of their rams house. Or you know. rams. Yeah, I know. We attack the same problem in two different ways. Uh, <laughs> we were a little bit more averse. So, so that's something I always carry. And then, of course, I always carry a watch. Mm -hmm. um, Bill always has a watch. Yeah. Very Bill and important. I have like the like the worst like watch tans ever, I think. Well, uh, yeah. So, but um, but yeah, and then you know, that. and then the biggest thing too, also with this, is get out and train with what you carry. You know, I see it so many times. Bill sees it nonstop. You know, this this is how Bill and I carry a gun every single day. Yet when most people go to a class, they put on a war belt. They put on a big outside the waistband circle or, holster. You know. Yeah. And, but this yeah. is but this is what they carry. This is what they use, or they use something. And you referenced the 1911 earlier. Not making fun of 1911s. No. Not making fun of the people that carry 1911s. I've carried a 1911. I carried a 1911 on duty for many yeah. years. But uh, I, I've seen several people. One of my, my he was a mentor of mine comes to mind, and uh, he would extol the virtues of the 1911 as as the greatest close quarters implement ever produced. 
and that was what you should get, that's what you should use, and we would get done shooting and doing our class stuff, and he would make sure no one was looking, that would go in the bag in the little J-frame that I never, in the 15 years I knew this man and trained with him, never saw him shoot. And he was an avid shooter, good okay. shooter with his 1911, but he never shot the J-frame that he actually lived with. Um, all these guns, when I talked about the mission, one of the things that I look at, and, and unfortunately recent events have kind of proven uh, this scenario to be viable, but uh, what I would hear, and I, I mentioned it with my, my, my police officers, the just in case get off me gun kind of scenario. What if it's not a get off me scenario? What if you have to make a shot, a critical shot at mm -hmm. 50, 60, 70 yards? Is your equipment up to it? Are you up to it? And I have, with both of these guns and the one that I've got on, I have taken shots at 50 yards in training, uh, gone out, and just to make sure, can I, in a panic-type situation, get good body hits on a humanoid target, uh, and, and even tighter yeah. than that within an 8-inch circle, on a humanoid target at 50, 60 yards? Is it likely? No. Realistically, it's not likely you're going to be in a gunfight. This is all, remember what we said earlier, what I said earlier, it's a... Uh, low frequency, high consequence event. They don't happen very often, but if they do, it's very important. So it does bode us well if we're really going to take this serious to consider some of these things now and make sure that our equipment is up to the mission at hand, which is saving our life or the lives of somebody yeah. we care about. Yeah, and and you know, and when you're training and stuff, like I give huge props to somebody if they show up with like a 43 or a Sig, you know, P365, because I'm like they get it. Yeah. That's that's what they're carrying, you know. Um, because we're not always, you know, like I said, you see these guys, they switch out their guns for training, but that's not what you're going to have in a fight. And it's and it's hard to, to translate Unless that. Unless you're kind of messed up like that. You guys. know, uh, <laughs> but, um, but it's one of those things where, you know, the gear is cool. It's what we, sh you know, we wanted to show you how we incorporate, you know, what looks like a lot of stuff into to average everyday life, everyday life. Um, and, and we do this consistently, you know, so take a look at, your system, evaluate, you know, what are things that you can improve on uh, to make it more reliable for you to carry it on a daily basis. Uh, you know, and like I said, if you've got any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. We appreciate you guys watching this. Make sure you hit the like button and until next time, be safe.